All right, folks, let's get the party started again. Next up is, <laughs> next up is Anna Livia Gomat. She's going to talk about, about bugs or, well, things that are not actually bugs, but biases. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today uh, to talk to you about a subject that has been on my mind for a few years. Um, I'm, so my name is Anna Livia, and I'm a software developer. And one of the things that um, so has been on my mind is this difference between when you're using a product and you're having an awful experience. Is it a bug? Like, is it something that was unintentional? Or is it a bias, meaning that the people who created the, the application you're using are actually having this systematic way of thinking of things that are, is slightly wrong and just ends up being very alienating for users? So um, the example that I think uh, summarizes really well is back in 2011. So um, at that time, we were all listening to Adele's Rolling in the Deep, just so you kind of get back into that zone. Um, uh, Apple introduced Siri. And uh, how many of you have ever used Siri? So quite a few. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but at first, one of the things that people used to do a lot is kind of ask Siri really silly questions, like, uh, where can I hide the body? Because you know, we all live that kind of criminal life. Um, and actually, it had answers, which was really, really cool. Um, and so people started asking, like, questions about, like, the meaning of life. Of course, it's 42. <laughs> um, but at some point, someone asked, well, where can I get an abortion? And the answer of Siri is, what? And then you start asking yourself, like, it knows where to hide a body, but it doesn't know where to find an abortion clinic in a country where it is legal to get an abortion. Um, and that's the question. Is Siri biased? Or is it a bug? And the answer from uh, Apple b before they fixed it was it's a bug. And so I'm kind of wondering if algorithms are neutral, or can algorithms be biased? So what we're going to do, we're going to first kind of look into uh, the biases that can, how can biases be in algorithms? And then we're going to see how biases can actually be in programs, but actually in the user or in the data used to train the program. And finally, um, one of the big questions I ask myself is, you can't really analyze your own biases. It's really hard. So how can you actually prevent your users from being alienated by the, your own biases that you put in the programs you create? So first of all, are algorithms neutral? Well, the first question, I'm trying to do this. OK. <laughs> so what is an algorithm but a model of the way we, as human, as individual, make decisions? And basically, it's all it is. It is our model of the world that we translate in a procedure. So if you go from the, if you, if you start with our model of the world, the way we see the world, our reality is biased because we have unique perspectives and also we're humans, <laughs> um, then you kind of realize that if, if the algorithms have our model of the world, then the algorithm become biased. And Dominique Cardon, who is a French sociologist, he wrote something that really um, uh, resonated with me. He said, as soon as we open the black box of algorithms, we realize that the choices they make for us are questionable and should be discussed because they offer different visions of society. So it's not only that they are biased, it's that it is our role as people who know how to read those algorithms to critique them and to have this distance to say, OK, this is something that has been created by human beings, and therefore it is imperfect and biased, and we have to find ways to talk about that. So one of the um, interesting frameworks to talk about that I found is called procedural rhetoric, 
which sounds very fancy, um, but it's basically it's a concept from the video game industry. And in the video game industry, there is that um, author, he's called Jan Bogost, and he analyzes games. And he has a, a book called Procedural, um, no, Persuasive Games. And in his book, he says that the rules that create the video games, like all the algorithms behind it, there is actually a rhetoric in it. So, for example, if you take a game like GTA, where uh, as a gangster, you can never, and in a poor neighborhood, you can never find fresh vegetables, and the only food available to you is fast food, there is like a critique of society behind it. And so, as game creators, we create, you can create rules of the world, like you make a model of the world. Like, I don't know, have you ever played Civilization? It's a game where you, like, you create an empire. Well, if you play Civilization, you, you're going to do some things, and then you're going to get better, and then you're going to try some things, and your empire is going to kind of fall or not, not um, evolve as well. So little by little, you're going to learn the rules of Civilization, and you're going to learn the way the game wants you to think. And then little by little, those rules, you will be uh, imprinted by those rules. Well, Think about how Facebook redefined friendship. Like Facebook said, you know, this is a friend and this is not a friend. So I think that we need to have the same uh, critical point of view with services that we have with games. And actually, games is a very good example because they are creating those kind of analytic tools. So how, how, what does it look like, biased algorithms? Well. First, let's think about normalcy. So we all have an idea of what is normal. We all have a model of the world where, for example, um, everyone, and I'm putting big air quote, everyone has a last name. Or everyone has parents. Or everyone uh, lives in a European city where we have 4G everywhere. And the problem with this normalcy is that it might, be not, it not, might not be normal for everyone. And we need to keep that in mind, that our users are way more diverse than we are in any team. And the, I don't know if, uh, if you ever sa saw that, there is a list called uh, Things Developers Believe. And it's a GitHub repo, and you can find it uh, with all the things that developers get wrong. Uh, and especially they think that no one has the last name Null. Like <laughs> um, so we, we, we can see that we can put a lot of bad mojo in our algorithms, but we can also create algorithms that prey, well, not prey, that will uh, be um, blind to our users own biases. And one of the biases I want to talk about is the negativity bias. And that means that when you read a bad review of something, it's going to affect you more than reading a good review of something. So let's say that you're looking for a restaurant tonight, and you're going to look at the list, and then you're going to have five people saying, this is a good restaurant, I had a great time. And then one person will say, this is the most awful experience I've had in my life. And always the bad review seems to be very dramatic. So, um, and, and this one review compared to the other five that were good will actually impact you more because we have this negativity bias. So if you think about all the services that use this kind of rating, we're used to rate everything. And not only everything, but now with services such as Uber, we rate kind of people. We rate a driver. We rate like this personal inter, uh, this personal um, contact we had with a, a person that provided a service, and we we start making this you know those stars and depending on our mood we're gonna get you know like really um, really judgmental or less judgmental, but at the end of the day, especially like for people who are in precarious situation or small businesses one bad review actually has a huge consequence and has very little consequence on the person actually giving the judgment. And I think that by... And there are some um, platforms who are trying 
to uh, mitigate that bias. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, but on Yelp or in um, Google Maps now, you have uh, those local guides, or like people who, are, who give a lot of reviews. So you know it's not just one person who just you know, woke up one day and wanted to trash someone. Um, so this is uh, one example of how our platform, even though the algorithm inside it is not biased, it will kind of play on the biases of the users. And maybe we have a responsibility to mitigate this because of the alienating impact it can have. Finally, uh, let's talk about machine learning because that's, um, that's something that is getting more and more traction every day. And it's something that is always based on data that you need to use to train your machine learning. And the problem with the data we use, like the data we actually have, is that it's actually very, some of it is very biased. Uh, typically, um, if you want to train an algorithm to do hiring for you, so you, you have this company and you say, I don't want humans to hire anymore because they're biased, so I'm going to train a computer to do it. And then you're going to give it all the records you have of the people you actually hired. But the problem is, because you had a bias hiring those people, you're going to teach it to hire in a very biased way, but on a larger scale. So it doesn't really deal with the problem that we have biased data, and the way we get that data is biased. So we need to be very careful about um, the way we train the algorithms that not only will work in one company, but let's say that this company that does the hiring, it gets really popular. Let's say it goes all over the world. Then we have these biased algorithms making decisions for a lot of people, so it scales up. So now that we've had this very grim moment together, <laughs> what can we do about it? And that's something I've, um, I'm struggling with because as a software developer, I don't want to look at my own code and, saying, and seeing biases. Like I want to think that my code is just very neutral and very welcoming, and um, sometimes it's not. Um, so here is the, some of the tips that I, we try to use. Uh, some of them are to catch, uh, try to catch as soon as possible. Go from the... Um, Start with thinking that you have biases in your algorithms. They are somewhere, and now your job is to catch them. And if possible, catch it before you have a user pulling their hair because their last name is like one letter long. And for some reason, at some point in the life of your project, someone said that a last name couldn't be less than two characters. Um, try to find those experiences. It can be a high abandon rate. It can be uh, found maybe in like the support emails. It can be found maybe on review websites, where people are going to tell about, uh, talk about their experiences, and so you can kind of catch them there, and tell like try to as soon as possible um, try to deal with their problems so that it doesn't happen to other people. I don't know if uh, some of you have uh, done a bit of um, machine learning, but there is an expression that I found to be the most poetic thing. It's called a random forest. And a random forest is actually a lot of decision trees. And because there are a lot, it's a forest. And I think that this idea of like a forest made of like data decision trees is kind of really poetic. But this, the idea is that if you have one decision tree, if you train your machine learning to have this one way to take, make decisions, it's going to try to overfit the data, the training data you give it. So if, from my understanding, what you do is that you create a lot of decision trees like that make decisions um, in, a, in different ways because you give them very um, varying type of data as entry, and then you can have something that is way not trying to overfit the data and actually gives you better results. But the point behind this all is that if your team is a random forest, you will have better results than if your team has the same way to make decisions. So different backgrounds, different life experience is actually going to give you this different perspective. It's not going to give you all the perspective, but it's going to be better than have just this one way of making decisions. 
And finally, um, the thing that I'm trying to do is to check what you find normal. So have a checklist. Have a checklist of uh, go to that repo on GitHub of things programmers believe and just take things one after the other and check if um, what happened. Like, for example, have you um, ever been taking a plane and you have the boarding pass on your phone and your battery is getting really low? And you get that fear of saying, what happens when I don't have battery anymore? And I, I get scared. Like, I get like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do once like, I have no battery left. And I'm thinking, the problem is I, don't, I, I, I get this fear because no one told me what to do. If, like, everyone is like, oh, yeah, just put it on your phone. It's going to be great. But what should I do if I don't have batteries anymore? Well, now, if I make an app, I ask myself, what happens if my user needs my app but doesn't have battery anymore? What happens if they don't have service because they're in the subway? What happens if, and so there's that list and that checklist. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I realized recently in the project I'm working on, I'm working on an open source project, so we have a lot of documentation to kind of be self-serving. Uh, and one of the things I realized is that I'm always trying to have this very good English. I'm always trying to, to to sound like I really know what I'm talking about. And then I realized that my bias is to think that everyone speaks very good English. Like all developers all around the world, they have this beautiful English, and the whole point of coming to, my, to this project is to judge my English level. It is not, so I realized that. Uh, but the idea now is, can I make my English maybe simpler? or more accessible without oversimplifying what I'm trying to say, but so that people come to, the, to, to our repo and they actually feel good about reading it because they get all the, all the meaning that I'm trying to convey. So uh, first, the algorithms we create as software developers, they're biased. Let's start with that, because they just they represent the way we have to represent the world, and not one piece of I don't think one piece of software yet can really encompass the whole human experience. And that that um, that bias it can be in the algorithm, it can be in the users that are going to use your algorithms, or it can be in the data that you use in to make decisions. And so before our users are alienated in some way or another, let's try to be very proactive and let's try to find those biases to make tech more inclusive. Thank you very much. <laughs> do, do we have time for questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. We absolutely have time for questions. Wonderful. You want to? Uh, if questions? someone Good. has. <laughs> Lacey. Is this already on? Yes, it is. Okay. Hi. Thank you Hi. so much for this talk. This was really useful. Um, for. Thank you. Sorry. I should have done that myself. <laughs> I'm really short. Um, but for. Sometimes you, you might kind of work on projects where you have a, a client or a need um, who, who feels like they need to represent their data in a, a way that does not actually represent the full diversity mm -hmm. of the human experience. Um, what, what are strategies that you have to sort of get clients on board with representing their data in a way that is more truthful? Um, that's a very, uh, I think it's a very good question. I think software development is one of the many areas where this question uh, happens. My first question would be, do they have other data? Because if the biased data is all that they have, it's going to be hard to represent it differently. So how do they gather that data? And it, are they making a choice in the data to kind of pick and choose? Or just do they might not have like unbiased data. So that's the first, the first kind of thing I would, uh, I would try to, to understand. And if they are pick and choosing, um, there is actually a, a talk, I think, to have about how um, it can be perceived or how it can be alienating for some people. I've, re I've realized in my career that often it's not that there are like some very biased people who hold their biased truth to be evident. Uh, most, most 
of the time is just people who don't think about like what happens if there's a disabled person trying to come in the building or what happens if you know there is a same-sex couple and uh, one of the uh, person wants to change their name uh, I, I've had this this case where uh, the, um, a form um, where you as a man you couldn't change your last name because it's just it wasn't used to be done like only women would change their name so there's the option just didn't exist and just saying like what happens if uh, is a, a good way to kind of open that uh, but if uh, their um, their bias is something that is more like something they believe or so, like I, I have no idea how to deal with that <laughs> thank you more questions I'm quite good at spotting biases <laughs> in other people's <laughs> work. And, um, uh, sometimes I don't always even react badly when they point it out in mine, but I, I know that uh, uh, understanding that there is a bias in one's work is quite difficult and also difficult to persuade someone else. Not that they should do a certain thing, but that there is a problem. What strategies... I mean, you just mentioned one right now about <laughs> saying what if. What other strategies will bring this out so people can come to it themselves without having to be taken there by you? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question, I think, because uh, one of the strategies I've, so I've seen and what I'm trying to do with my some of the tips and some of the strategies I, I'm trying to think about, the, the problem is most people realize it once they're faced with someone, like a client or a a friend or a user that is actually it took the time to come up to them and tell them their story. Which means you have to wait for what, 10 people or more to have a really bad experience for maybe one of them to take the courage and take the time and take the energy to come to you and explain their, you know, their issue. And most, when I, I talk about uh, biases, uh, often this is the answer, like, oh, uh, I was doing a training and this person came up to me and so I had this epiphany. But I'm trying to, uh, my question now, and that's, I mean, I haven't found one answer, but my question now is, how can we do that proactively? Like, without actually going through the whole thing where you have to alienate people to someday have your own realization. And that's where I found it hard also. And especially I find it hard on my own work. Like, I don't want to believe that my work is biased. I want to believe that I'm special. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm not, and so uh, I'm, I'm working hard on it. Uh, and I hope that we all do, because I think that's how we're going to make it tech a better place to be. Hi, thank you for Hi. the talk. Um, do you know if there is somewhere uh, like uh, a database or a repository or something of uh, counter-biased data, like a list of last names that are usual problems, a list of addresses that are usual problems and things like that? I haven't found it, but you're not the first person to ask me about it, so I think someone here? If they have some time, <laughs> should uh, maybe me should actually make it because I think having that training set like should sh would be a very a, a great way to start. Uh, if someone has it, uh, please put it on the Slack because I think we would all uh, use it really <laughs> uh, have a, a lot of uh, of, of fu fun. Uh, it would be very interesting to use it. But yes, I think there is a need for that. Uh, definitely. But again, uh, any list would not encompass maybe some of the uh, issues. Um, I I'm thinking, for example, you can have a list of names, but um, things like, uh, y you know, they are the languages where you write from uh, left to right. And that's kind of hard to have a list of, you know, like, so I'm thinking it's a first step, uh, but there's a whole also, and there is also other things to put in place. Uh, thank you for your question. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Are there more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.